Warren Wiersbe said that the Christian life is a land of hills and valleys. And you know, Warren Wiersbe had read Deuteronomy chapter 11. (laughs) Because Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, the Lord had said to the nation of Israel, He had said to them, the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys. And so Warren Wiersbe, thinking about that, said, you know what? The Christian life, likewise, is a life that is lived traversing hills and valleys. As far as the hills are concerned, I think these are times of genuine spiritual renewal. These are the high points. These are the mountaintop experiences, if you will. We tend to see Christ more clearly in these moments. We sense His presence more fully. We're growing in our faith. We're, we have a hunger to, to study and to know and to apply God's Word and to do His will. Maybe we're, we attend a couple's retreat and we're feeling refreshed and rejuvenated about our marriage relationship. Maybe we attend a missions conference and we're, we're energized concerning world missions and the need for evangelism. Maybe we attend a GROW conference and we're challenged in our discipleship and we want to draw closer to the Lord because we've been inspired by, by someone other than our pastor. Maybe we, maybe we uh, are just generally feeling challenged and we're feeling encouraged in that challenge and we're feeling inspired. The fire is rekindled and we're inspired to grow. We're relating with people. We're helping people. We're attending Bible studies. Maybe we're leading Bible studies. These are the mountaintop experiences. These are the hills in the Christian faith. Sort of like the disciples had on the Mount of Transfiguration in that passage before that we studied last week. We need those those hills. We need that encouragement. We need that sense of refreshing. We need these hills. They renew us. But I'd be lying to say that we can just stay in, upon those hills. I mean, let's face it. Didn't Peter say, let's build a tent. Let's stay on the hill. One for you, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. We'll just stay here and bask in this glory. Wouldn't that be nice? But there are also valleys. There are valleys in the Christian life. I mean, we need no more proof of that than the time that was just taken to pray for just a fraction of the individuals within this body who are dealing with very real situations, placing them in the valley of their Christian life experience. It seems that in those moments sometimes it can be a challenge to take God at His Word and to trust His plan for our lives. In fact, When you're dealing with something that could be terminal, you wonder, what is the point in all of this anyway? And I'll say this, and you'll see this as we unpack the text in a moment. That is not unusual on this side of heaven. Because though we have faith, that faith is imperfect. And that faith is mixed with doubt. We may have conflict within our our families, within these, these valley type moments. Relationships can be strained, maybe even unraveling. Kids constantly challenging our patience. Our work in the ministry, we we put the time in and we don't seem to be sensing the tangible reward and we wonder if it's worth it. We we plan and we organize and, and then people maybe vote with their feet and, and say, no, nah, I'm not really into that. That can be discouraging. We fade into depression. We drift from God's Word. Our prayer life disappears. And so the downward spiral can go. Those are the valleys in the Christian life. But listen, the valleys are as important as the hilltop experiences. Because without the valleys, this is where the refining comes. This is where where the growth opportunities exist. If Jesus wanted us to stay on the mountaintop, He would have said yes to Peter when He said, let's build tents. But He came down off the mountaintop into the valley. 
And what are they confronted with? What we're going to learn about right now. He brought them down from the mountaintop right into the valley. Very interesting. And in leading them into the valley, the Lord of faith, Jesus Christ, taught His disciples some very important lessons about effective kingdom ministry work. Listen, it can only be done by the power of God. True disciples, listen, this this passage is all about faith, all right? That's our key word for today. It's all about faith. I will wait for you. I will trust in you. Faith, trust, this is the key word. So listen, if we were to pinpoint a statement to guide the rest of what we do today, then it's going to be this. You ready? Here's our big idea statement for today. True disciples of Jesus live by faith. faith. Hey, good job. True disciples of Jesus live by faith. And what does that faith do? It glorifies God. That faith that we live by should glorify God. Genuine believers in Jesus Christ are disciples of Him who live by faith. And what does Jesus expect of His disciples? Well, I think Jesus wants His disciples, according to this passage, to know that sometimes they lack faith. Sometimes they lack faith faith. Here's a principle that's going to guide the rest of what we unpack here in these verses. Verses 14 through 18. Here's the guiding principle. That our faith is imperfect. Doubts can mix in. Our faith is imperfect. Doubts can mix in. Here's the situation. Jesus had left his nine disciples in the valley. He took his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. He went up on top of the Mount of Transfiguration. While up on top of the Mount of Transfiguration, that's the mountaintop experience. But he had left these nine disciples down in the valley. And if you remember, in Mark chapter 6, verse 7, he had commissioned the twelve very specifically to do his work for him. Verse 7, chapter 6, And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, And gave them, listen, authority over unclean spirits. He had given them authority over unclean spirits. He had given them authority to preach the word. He had given them authority to heal people. They had the power of God at their disposal. He had sent them out two by two to do things that included casting out unclean spirits. So now file that away in your brains and look what happens. A man with a demon-possessed son shows up looking for Jesus. But Jesus is up on top of the mountain. The other nine, who had already been commissioned, sent out two by two, left behind in the valley with the power to cast out demons, are there to help. And they failed. Critical and contentious scribes show up and are arguing with the disciples, probably over the disciples' inability to cast out the demons and probably questioning their power to begin with, and by questioning theirs, questioning the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no worse thing to have a a gigantic audience as you fall flat on your face. And so you can imagine the desperation and the struggle and the devastation that these disciples must have experienced. Can you relate yet? Now understand this, the disciples loved Jesus. The disciples believed in Him. There had already been a confession from Peter on behalf of the rest of the disciples, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now I know there was one among them who was an imposter. However, we know that these disciples had already recognized Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior sent from above. This wasn't about, for these disciples, genuine faith versus false faith. This wasn't about belief versus unbelief. This was about imperfect faith. They did believe in Him. They had been given authority from Jesus to cast out demons. 
But in this case, according to verse 18, they were not able. Why? What happened? I think their faith wasn't where it needed to be. The disciples discovered that they had, listen, limitations in the flesh. I think that this was spiritual work that was required, that they were trying to use physical strength in their own flesh to complete. Are you thinking about the applications in your own life yet? The Christian life is a life that is lived in hills and valleys. And sometimes in the valleys, what do type A personalities do? They turn to their own strength and they say, I can double down and I've got this. No, you don't. No, we don't. No, I don't. We cannot fight spiritual battles in the flesh. We will lose just like the disciples. Believers in Jesus Christ are disciples of Him who live by faith and He wants His disciples to know that sometimes they lack faith. Because we, on this side of heaven, have to contend with the new nature that has been imparted to us in Jesus Christ and the old nature that remains that is at war together with the flesh. That's what makes our faith imperfect. And we need to grow in our faith. We need to learn to wait for you. Psalm 130. Because that's what He wants. But the problem is, is that we don't wait for Him. We try to get out ahead of the problem and deal with it ourselves. And that's the issue here for the disciples. And that's the issue for all of Jesus' disciples. Is that we have to recognize that our faith is imperfect. That's why He wants total dependency upon Him. So, we have to understand that we lack faith. So what's the answer? Well, that's the problem. What's the solution? Verse 19. Verse 19. We have to understand according to this portion of the text. He answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. You know what Jesus is saying in that statement? I am the Lord of faith. I am the Lord of your faith. Oh, faithless generation. And understand this. He's not just, he's talking to his disciples, but he's talking to the generation. And his words echo throughout that generation to future generations and land right here upon us. Oh, faithless generation. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Now listen, here's the principle. Here's the principle. The problem is is that we lack faith because our faith is imperfect. But Jesus is the Lord of faith. That's the principle. Jesus is the Lord of faith. And I'll expand on that, but let's read this text. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured from sinners, such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. When you are sensing the inevitable feelings of doubt, self-doubt, doubt concerning your situation, that things will do an about face and head in the... When you get to feeling that your faith is mixed with doubt, remember this. You can't will yourself to greater faith. Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter of your faith. 
So, what is the solution? He wants our total dependency on Him so that He can do His work. So by being in God's Word, by committing ourselves to prayer, stopping and waiting for Him, that demonstrates, and in that waiting, go to Him in prayer. That waiting is what He wants. We didn't sing, I will get out in front of you. I will get out in front of you. We sang, I will wait for you. Right? There's nothing like being surrounded by a crowd, like I said, when you fall. And the disciples in this context, in this moment, must have been overwhelmed with feelings of inadequacy. And so, then Jesus speaks. And he said, like I said in, in verse 19, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? It's a problem that we all have. Not just the disciples who are present, but all of us. And now look at verse 20. Look at verse 20. And they, he, Jesus had said, verse 19, bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the Spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. When evil spirits, you have to understand this, when evil spirits are confronted by Jesus, there's always a violent reaction. Why is that? They know who he is. They know who he is. We've already seen on several occasions throughout Mark's gospel, you can jot this down, Mark chapter 1, verses 23 to 26, Mark chapter 3, verses 11 to 12, Mark chapter 5, verses 6 to 13. We've already seen on several occasions, every time the demons are aware that Jesus is in their midst, those demons shriek, I know who you are, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. They know who He is. He is the Lord of faith. And so in verse 21, Jesus asked His Father, how long has this been happening to Him? And the man said, from childhood. And sometimes the demon, the text says, and sometimes um, it often casts him into fire and into water to destroy him. And so what we see here is, um, is a situation where this demon seems to have control over this boy. And the father comes with the son and approaches the disciples because he's looking for Jesus. He believes that Jesus is the one who can help him. Jesus, listen, according to verse 21, understand this. Jesus knew about this boy. He knew how long he had been suffering. Why did Jesus say, how long has this been happening? Did Jesus need some information so that he could make an informed decision? (laughs) No. He's omniscient. Jesus knows everything. Jesus knows about this boy. He knows how long he had been suffering. He wasn't asking the question for himself. Who was he asking the question for? He was asking the question for the Father who was there and for all who were watching so that he could demonstrate to the Father that he is the author and perfecter of faith. And he's asking the question for the sake of demonstrating to his disciples who need some instruction right now in the valley that he is the author and the perfecter of their faith. This is a lesson in understanding that Jesus is is the Lord of faith. Now look what happens. The Father says that that it has often cast Him into fire and into water to destroy Him. And then He says, listen, (laughs) but if you can do anything, if you can do anything, want to know the three worst words you could say to Jesus is? If you can. Now Jesus lived the sinless life. He had to. 
If he's the author and perfecter of faith, then only perfection can be the author of and perfect faith. I'm afraid that in that moment, if I were him, would, are you kidding me? If I can. I mean, he comes close because he repeats what the man said. If I can. Listen, and then he says, he says this, all things are possible for one who believes. All things are possible for one who believes. Listen, in verses 21 through 27, in this chunk of the text that we're talking about, I think we see that the man when he came, the man when he came had sufficient faith. There was sufficient faith of that father to go to Jesus. One who believes, every single one of us who believes, has been imparted by the Father above sufficient faith to believe. It's sufficient unto salvation. But it's imperfect to live this life. And the process of sanctification is a process of bringing that faith into perfection, which will not be realized until we are in heaven and we are glorified. At that point, it will be perfect. But our quest on this earth is to draw closer and closer to Him who is the author, yes, and the perfecter of our faith. That's a total dependency. That needs to be a total dependency. So I think we see here, first of all, a sufficient faith of the Father to go to Jesus. But we see His imperfect faith that says, if you can. Now, that's a dangerous place to be. Because when you start saying things like, if you can, then you presume that there is actually a possibility that he cannot. And so what is a, what is a person to do but step in and try to ensure that the if you can becomes a can? You know what I mean? This is, this is the, the mindset of all of us, and I think this is what was happening with the disciples. Instead of stopping and going immediately to prayer, they were overwhelmed by a circumstance because this demon was like, uh, unlike one that they had ever encountered before. It, when Jesus says later in the passage, this kind, it's like this species, this, this, uh, this particular brand of demon. So that tells me that there are very strong ones and powerful ones and then powerful ones because they're all powerful and they're not to be underestimated. So we see a sufficient faith to go. We see an imperfect faith that says if. But we have to understand in this, in this text also that there is that perfecting work of the Lord of faith who is Christ Jesus Himself. Now, not only have we seen the perfecting work of Jesus on display, we see perfect faith. He's the Lord of faith. We see that He is instructive we see that he is also compassionate. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Now, we said in the very beginning of our Gospel of Mark series that Mark, more than likely, having been a companion of Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote. But a lot of his content came from Peter. And so Peter, writing, undoubtedly, perhaps, whether it be this situation or other situations like it together, writes in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Why? Why would he say that? Well, one reason could be verse 21 of Mark chapter 9. Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood. And then we see also that there was a, uh, a move by Jesus to take that boy by the hand after he had cast the demons out. Everybody thought the boy was lying there as a corpse and he was dead. Jesus takes him by the hand, picks him up. This is a demonstration of compassion once again by Jesus. He says, finally, Peter does. 1 Peter chapter 3. All of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. 
To sympathize means to care about someone else's pain, to care about someone else's hurt, to care about someone else's trouble, to care about someone else's grief, to care about someone else's misfortune. Jesus is a God of compassion. Jesus was demonstrating sympathy by allowing the man to share his pain. How long has this been happening? And the man tells him. And everybody gets to listen, including Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith. Listen, mature faith seeks unity. It's sympathetic. It's compassionate. It's tender. It's loving. And it's humble. And all of these things, the author and the perfecter of our faith, demonstrated in that moment. Now look at what happens. The father comes and he says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us. Jesus absolutely demonstrated compassion. And help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Now here's one of Mark's most favorite words. Immediately. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Listen, his sufficient yet imperfect faith recognized Jesus as the author and perfecter of his faith. And he says, I do believe, but I understand that I have doubts. Help my doubting. He says, I do believe, but help me have more faith. He may have said, and it isn't recorded, I don't want to say if anymore. (laughs) I want to know, and I want to be confident. Jesus intended to use this man as an illustration for the disciples of what even imperfect faith in him can accomplish. The man cried out, and what a lesson. So here's my question. How can we be as honest as this father? How can we be as honest as this father about our faith? Well, maybe we say, I am determined to obey as we're on our knees praying, but I need more determination. Maybe we say, I am willing to obey, but Lord, please help me to have more willingness. Maybe we get on our knees and we say, I I want to be patient, but I know I need more patience. I think we can assume that the nine disciples, when confronted with this man and his demon-possessed son, I think we can assume that those nine disciples hadn't been this honest. Otherwise, he wouldn't have looked at them and everyone who was gathered there to say, oh, faithless generation, while he's looking at his disciples for everyone to hear. How long do I have to put up with you? Listen, Jesus is the Lord of faith. And Jesus is not limited by our imperfect faith. Even the strongest faith is always mixed with a measure of doubt. Our faith is imperfect. He wants our total dependency on Him. You know, if we had perfect faith, what need would we have of Him? Right? We don't have perfect faith. And that's the way He wants it. He wants us to be totally dependent. Listen, self-sufficiency is the enemy of total dependency. Self-sufficiency is the enemy of total dependency. If He is the Lord of faith, then we line up under, we submit in faith to His will in our lives. So believers in Jesus Christ live by faith and It's important to acknowledge that sometimes we lack faith, but we have to understand that Jesus is the Lord of faith. And that Jesus is the Lord of faith, He teaches us some very important lessons about faith. And this is where we want to end our study for today. So here's the third principle. Here's the third principle. Trusting in ourselves demonstrates a lack of faith. Trusting in ourselves demonstrates a lack of faith. Prayer acknowledges God's power. Prayer acknowledges 
God's power. Why did the disciples fail? Jesus was asked by his disciples, why couldn't we do it? The simple question is, the simple answer to that question is, they lacked faith. They had a sufficient faith to believe. They believed that Jesus was the Son of the Most High God, just like all of the demons acknowledged him as the Son of the Most High God. But that faith has to go beyond that point. And they were still feeling a sense of self-sufficiency, which is the enemy of total dependency. Jesus said, verse 29, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Mature faith says, I know I can't do this on my own. I have to imagine the scene that as, these, uh, as this father with his son came forward and Jesus isn't there, what is our tendency but to spring into action? And when we spring into action without first stopping and waiting upon the Lord and seeking Him in prayer, when we spring into action without considering the author and perfecter of our faith, the Lord of faith, Jesus Christ, and going to Him in humble and submitted prayer, when we spring into action, we are springing into self-sufficiency mode. And that's no way to go about living the Christian life. Because we will fail, just like the disciples, every single time. Immature faith says, I've got this. You know what else? Here's the truth. A lack of faith ignores the power of God. It ignores the power of God. How many times have we tried to serve others with the same self-reliance as the disciples? When we dive right into ministry work and we, we employ our own ideas, our own perspectives, our own methods, our own wisdom, our own preferences, those are all efforts in self-sufficiency. How many Sunday school lessons have been taught in our own power? I wonder how many elder meetings and deacon meetings have, have taken place in our own power. How many sermons have been delivered in our own power? Where faith is lacking, prayer is too. John MacArthur said that prayer is the highway that faith takes into the power of God. God wants our total dependency upon Him. The most important lesson we can learn here is that a pull yourself up by your bootstrap, bootstraps mentality, which has so typified the United States of America through the ages, is the antithesis of what Christ is actually teaching. I'm not against hard work. I'm not against, and neither is, is God, because when He created us, He created us to work. The only reason it got hard is because we sinned wasn't supposed to be this hard. So it's not about that. It's about a proper perspective. Stop. Breathe. Go to the Lord in prayer. Then go about the ministry work. We can't ever approach kingdom ministry from a human standpoint. From the strength of men. It requires total dependency in Christ. And that total dependency will be manifest as a prayerful dependency. So we started here considering what Wearsby had said, that the Christian life is a land of hills and valleys. Mountaintop experiences encourage us in our faith. We need those mountaintop experiences. We need those hills. We need the refreshing. We need the energizing power of those victories, if you will. The valley experiences challenge our faith, and the valley experiences give us opportunity for meaningful instruction. May I submit to you that both the mountaintop experiences and the valley experiences are both equally as valuable. 
That's what the Christian life is comprised of. A faith that glorifies God is one that lives in total dependency to Christ, relying on His power, seeking to do His will. The Persian Empire had conquered the Neo-Babylonians in the 500s BC, and King Cyrus the Great had allowed 50,000 Jews from Israel to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple under the governor of Jerusalem who had been appointed at the time. His name was Zerubbabel. There were two ministering prophets during this time. One prophet was Haggai, and the other one was Zechariah. Haggai encouraged Jewish exiles in their work of rebuilding the temple because they were allowed to go and rebuild the temple. Haggai was encouraging them in that way. Zechariah encouraged and, and urged upon the people repentance of sin and a renewal of their covenant with God. The word of God to Zerubbabel through Zechariah the prophet was very simple. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, Not by might, he says, nor by power, but by, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Construction on the temple had been stopped. And the work of rebuilding that temple would only be accomplished by God's Spirit and not by might nor by man's power. In other words, there needed to be total dependency upon God. And don't think that in these circumstances that you can just go and by your own strength accomplish this task. It will be impossible, says the Lord of hosts. And so just as Zerubbabel would need to depend on the Spirit of the Lord to accomplish His work, so do you and me, every single Christian that walks this earth. Not by might, not by cunning, not by your own wisdom, not by self-sufficiency, not by any of that, nor by power. You can't, you can't overpower your circumstances, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. God's people have no ability in themselves to shine the light of God's truth to those people who are walking in darkness. Because you know what? Kids, let's come back around to the main thing and let's keep the main thing the main thing. We said right from the very beginning, right, that true disciples of Jesus, what do they do? They live by and that faith that imperfect faith that is totally dependent upon God is going to glorify God. Amen? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this time that we've been able to unpack this passage that you have given to us. And Father, I just thank you that you have given us a sufficient faith to believe unto salvation. I thank you, Father, that you are at work perfecting our faith because we understand that our total dependence upon Jesus, who is the Lord of faith, is the only way that we can draw closer to you. Father, I thank you for the mountaintop experiences of our Christian life. And I thank you for the valley experiences because together they shape and mold us into who it is that you have designed us to be. I thank you, Father, for teaching us these lessons in faith. And I just pray that we would be eager to apply them to the manner in which we live our lives. For it is in Jesus' name we pray, who is the author and perfecter of our Amen.